Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 and 23. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 and 23. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 and 23. The title of the message is, What the Devil Wants, What the Devil Wants. So this is what the devil wants from you. So 1 Samuel 15, 22 and 23. The Bible says, And Samuel said, Had the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Brother Richard, can you please pray for the message? Dear Heavenly Lord God, we pray unto you, Father, to please be with us today. Please fill Pastor Jay with your Holy Spirit. Lord God, please use him. Give him the freedom to preach unto us a sermon that will change our heart yeah. and change our mind from inside out that we may be better Christians in this world, Lord. We pray unto you, Father, to please fill every single one of us, brothers and sisters here in Christ, with your Holy Spirit. Help us to clear our mind and clear our heart that we may hear the sermon and keep all the worldly thoughts away from us, Lord. Amen. Please help us. Uh, Father, we thank you for our free gift of eternal salvation through your precious Son, Lord Jesus Christ, for Him shedding His precious blood on the cross at Calvary, for His blood does wash away all of our sins, Amen. past, present, and future. We thank you, Lord. We don't deserve it. We're just sinners saved by grace. I don't even think I would be able to save another person, Lord. But you, Almighty God, you did it for us. Amen. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the love that you showed us on the cross at Calvary. Father, we pray that you please uh, bestow a little bit of your grace, just a little more, Lord, uh, grace unto us, uh, that we may be more faithful unto you, that we may have brotherly love amongst each other, and that we may have the love for the lost soul. Amen. And in this God-forsaken world, Lord, uh, times... Times are really getting really bad, Lord, and we know that that's a good sign because you're coming soon, Lord. Amen. And we pray for your soon return to come down to earth, Lord, and just to rapture us, take us back to heaven, Lord. There'd nothing be better than that than if you were to come down and take us back to heaven, Lord. We pray for your soon return. Father God, we pray for any of the brethren that might be uh, going through any illnesses, Lord. Please be with them, comfort them. Thank you, Lord God, and we pray that you bless the day and protect us from any spiritual or physical attacks. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. What the devil wants. I mean, if you know what the devil wants, you should be able to prepare against his wiles and his devices. But however, as Christians, you know what the devil wants, but you always give it away. So what does the devil really want? The devil wants your heart. Uh, to tell you the conclusion of the message right away, devil just wants your heart. And once devil gets at any part of your heart, he's happy. You know, he knows that he could get to you and he could control you and he could make sure that you don't do anything for Lord Jesus Christ. When you don't give all your heart to anything, and that's not really being an obedient, I guess, servant, children, worker, or anything in life. As you look at your own self, if you don't give all your heart, that means that you're being a disobedient in any areas of your life. If a child goes, Lord, I mean, to their parents, I'm only going to obey you 50% of my life. You know, you get a spanky, and you should get a spanky, right? And when your spouse tells you, I'm only going to be, you know, faithful to you for 50%, you know, you shouldn't marry that person before you got married. And after you got married, you have a big issue, so you have to resolve it. You know, at work, I'm only going to give you 
and I'm just going to be faithful to you for 50%. And as Christians, you don't give all that you have to the Lord. That's what the devil wants. The devil just wants your heart. The devil has, for some of you, the devil has all of your heart right now, even though you're a Christian. So don't be, you know, naive that, you know, I'm saved, you know, I can't sin no more as some doctrinally, you know, messed up people will say, you know. I mean, spiritually speaking, you can't, but physically, you're always able to do horrible things. You know, you can't go out there and commit murder. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you're not going to rob a bank. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you're not going to, you know, commit all those terrible sins that's listed in the Word of God. You can and you will if you let the devil have what he wants, which is your heart. You know, a lot of times when we look at Saul as an example, we see you and I, right? God will test you. That's a, no, that's a given. I said it many, many times. After you get saved, you know, your sins are washed away past, present, and future once and for all, right? Your body and your soul separated once and for all through spiritual circumcision. So you never have to worry about burning in hell. However, in order to really live a victorious Christian life, you have to understand that you have a daily battle every day. You come to church today for what reason? And hopefully because you want some revival in your life, especially in your heart. Revival needs to happen on a daily basis. Devil does not want you to have any type of revival. Why? Because defeated soul or someone who's down all the time, devil doesn't have to worry about. You know, who's the worst type of people that you want to be around? Debbie Downers, right? Yes. In a wet blankets. Whether you're in a safe society or unsafe society, they are someone that you do not want to be with. Unless you're Debbie Downer yourself. And then you have a Debbie Downer club, right? Man, the... <laughs> In those minds, I think, you know, your, if you hang around like that, your mouth structure will definitely go this way, you know, you know this pouting, you know. The funny thing is that people love to be a Debbie Downer, though. I mean, people love negativity as Christians when things don't go your way. First thing you do is, you know, everything in my life is terrible, horrible, Every person that I deal with is the devil themselves, you know. Every situation is, you know, the pitfall, you know, it's the trap. You know, it, everything, like you're driving and there's a pothole. Oh, man, that pothole is just made for me. You know, every, no one else is driving through it. It's just me. And I'm going to break my car. Everything. Why does that happen? Because you have self-deception. You hide behind everything. You... Don't understand that devil wants you to be deceived. And especially after you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he doesn't want you to do anything for Lord Jesus Christ. He wants you to stay dormant. He wants you to be like nothing. He doesn't want you to do anything. Instead, he'll rather you mess it up. But he doesn't care about that. As long as you don't do anything for the Lord, he's happy. Yeah. right? If you don't do anything that the Lord tells you to do, he's happy. Right? If you don't make Lord Jesus Christ happy, he's happy. Right? I mean, opposite is that if you make Lord Jesus Christ happy, he's going to be unhappy. But how many times have you ever thought about that? You always think that, you know, I disappoint Lord. I mean, that's given. We disappoint the Lord on a daily basis because, you know, we don't live up to the standard of the Word of God. Right. However, you should realize that there's someone behind who's always smiling when you fail the Lord. That's the devil. Devil wants your heart, any part of your heart, devil wants you to be deceived that, hey, can you imagine if you guys are a mobster, right? And you're proud of being a mobster. You know why? Because I'm good to my mom. I'm good to my family. That's why I'm proud. But how about all the people that you've killed? All the people's lives that you've destroyed? You don't think about that. So devil wants you to think that way. Whatever you're doing even though you might not be obeying the word of God, it's okay. There's a justification for it, right? You had to steal because you had to feed the family, right? You had to, you know, commit certain sin. 
because you were in that situation. Any other human would have done the same thing. And then devil will start justifying everything. Oh, yeah, you know, you don't have to obey the word of God. You don't have to what the, obey what the preaching said. You don't have to obey what the Bible study said because it doesn't fit your lifestyle, right? You are who you are. Yeah, it's ridiculous when people always say, accept the person as who they are, right? I mean, I don't really want to accept someone who's a you know, murderer as who they are. I want them to change, yeah. right? I, mean, I don't want someone who always, you know, pouts as who they are. Like, man, I'm going to be weary and dreary all the time yeah. listening to that person. So you don't, you shouldn't have a, you know, added to that, you know, I accept you as who you are, right? Of course, as a sinner who needs to be saved by grace at that point. I mean, Lord God said, Jacob, I love Esau, I've hated, right? Not because, you know, just a, he, he, his sinful nature and stuff, just because he's a sinner, that's why. You have to change. And don't hide behind the fact that, you know what, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, and I just can't do anything better. Self-pity comes in as well. How many of you guys always thought that, man, you know what, Lord, I'm a wicked sinner, and I just can't go on. But you say that to the Lord almost all the time because you never truly repent. I mean, devil always wants you to just go about halfway. True repentance is turning away. Yep. Half-hearted repentance is just feeling sorry. Right. Like Judy. I mean, not Judy. <laughs> Judah, right? <laughs> <laughs> Jude, Judas, right? Yes. Yeah. You guys knew. I mean, if you laughed, you knew who I was talking about. If you didn't laugh, probably you're like, who's Judy, right? You know? <laughs> Yeah, what book? You know, is it from Book of Hezekiah? You know, sometimes I ask, hey, let's turn to Book of Hezekiah. Like, oh, where is it? Where is it in the minor prophet, major prophet? You know, is it one of the book in the first books? I mean, if you don't read the Word of God, you wouldn't know. And they had people like Judas had remorse. They felt sorry. But a lot of times you feel like that because you got caught. Whenever you get caught, it tells you two things. Whether you realize that you're really, really a terrible, horrible sinner who needs to turn from your ways, or you're that other person. Man, I'm going to do better not to get caught next time. And that's the horrible thing about human nature. When you get caught, first, your instinct is that, man, what did I do wrong to get caught? Instead of coming forward, and be like, man, I did wrong. I mean, what was wrong with Saul? He thought sacrifice was better than obedience, and he tried to give excuse after excuse after excuse. If he had repented right away, I'm sure his life would have gone the different way. But he tried to give excuse after excuse. Then what does devil want? Your heart? And devil wants your heart to give excuse all the time. If you're a type of person that gives excuses, then you have to understand that that's what makes devil happy. Lord had compassion on people regardless, right? Why? Because he knew we are imperfect. However, after you got saved, you can't stay and try to be like, give a testimony after testimony that, you know, I'm such an imperfect person, you know. I commit sin, and I've committed terrible sin after I got saved. Before I got saved, and I was okay, I tried to be religious, but after I got saved, I wanted to experience more of a God's grace. So I commit bigger sins so that I could tell people that, hey, Lord forgives even a sinner like me who commits bigger and bigger sins. I mean, God forbid, you know, go, go to Romans chapter 6, right? I mean, go to Romans chapter 7, where it tells you how to have victory over sin. But it's all about people giving excuse after excuse after excuse. And in order for you to understand that, you know what? Have I been giving my heart to the devil? You have to be honest with yourself. You have to come to realization that, you know what? I may have been deceiving my own self. I have been, you know... 
hiding behind certain things to do these things. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Again, as I mentioned, you'll be tested for sure. Verse 3. And tests are going on all the, all the time. Whether you like education or not, you know, not many, many people will say you don't learn anything from school, which is kind of true because you don't really apply it after school days, right? But your life will always have tests every day. Yes. And you have to accept that. And devil wants you to fail all the time. You know, we do have that saying, you know, you learn from failures, right? But that means that you're going to have victories after failure. Amen. That's why you learn from it. However, if you have failures after failures after failures, then you haven't learned anything from failures, right? right. Go to 1 Samuel 15, 3. The Bible says, Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. He was given a command to destroy everything, including infant and suckling. Right? I don't know about you. Probably it's going to be pretty difficult, you know, if you see little babies, right? But Lord's command is destroy them all. And this is where your choice comes. Are you going to do whatever Lord tells you to do? I mean, that's the test. Lord's saying, don't think about what humans like to think. Don't think about what news media tells you. Don't think about what school tells you. Don't even think about what your mommy and daddy tells you. Just listen to me. If I tell you to go do this, you got to do it. Yes. And that's what you understand as you go on with your Christian life that I'm being tested on a daily basis. If, you're so, if you don't know that you're being tested even right now, then you're very naive. That means you're deceived. At this moment... Devil will try to have your heart. Amen. Devil's like, you know what? You got the message. You read the main verses. Let's think about what you're going to do tonight. Mm. Right? So after church, where are we going to go? You know, let's talk about lunch. Right? Well, so the church has good food. So what's going to be you know, our lunch today? Or you're going to start thinking about tomorrow's work. Right? Oh, yeah, man. You know. I have a work day tomorrow, you know, Monday blues, but, you know, let's see how I'm going to get through it. I mean, you start thinking about all this needless stuff, and you're like, oh, man, you know. And number one thing a lot of times people think is, oh, you know, when is this thing going to end, right? You want to go get your coffee. You want to get some, you know, break time. You want to talk to someone, right? Man, I can't wait for this thing to be over. But you don't think it like first 10, 15 minutes. You start thinking it after 20 minutes, after 25 minutes. Man, God forbid, if it goes past by 30 minutes and you start looking at your watch, those of you who have watch, and if it goes past that, if it you know, nears one hour, uh, you're like already drained. You're like, man, I have to go home. I mean, that's the attitude that you have. Yes. When Lord says, kill everything, he meant it. Yeah. In your own life, you're going to be tested. To kill all the sin in your life. Amen. You have to kill every sin in your yes. life. Amen. Right? It's not just, you know, major sins. Right? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, some of the things. Okay. You don't kill. You don't murder. Okay. You obey that. I think 99% of the people obey that. Right? But what about those other sins? Right? You know, lustful sins, which is huge nowadays. With the advancement of technology, everybody has access to anything inappropriate. And it's being taught by school. Man, I, I can't utter it from the pulpit, but I've, I hear and I read stories of things that people are made to teach at school to seven and eight-year-olds. Wow. They're made to watch certain stuff that, I mean, if I'm a parent, you know, that's the first petition I'm going to do. Yes. Close it down. We don't want that curriculum. This seven, eight-year-old shouldn't be watching something that as dirty and nasty to let them, to tell them, hey, you know, this is how you're going to experience. This is what you have to stop. They don't need to know. Man, when I was seven and eight, all I thought about was G.I. Joe. Yes. 
Right? All I thought about was playing with, you know, Mario. marbles and stuff, right? I think when I was growing up, I did have like Super Mario 2, yeah. you know? I was like, I wanted to play some Nintendo or Game Boy or Woo. something. But these days, it's all about, you know, this human change, transformation, gender ideology. It's all of those. You're not teaching kids the basic, necessary stuff. You're just teaching kids to be messed up. Yes. I mean, all, all the kids are thinking about is, how am I going to fit in this society? If I don't fit in this society, I'm just going to choose different gender. Mm. I mean, that's not how God made you to be, yeah. right? I mean, that's why, you know, I don't want to go off topic too much, but you see this school athletic programs. Yeah. You hear it all the time. You know, even though I may be a little older and stuff, if I were to just say, you know, I'm a female, I see myself a female, I think I could join some of the teams in the, you know, girls team and I'll just be the best player there because we're physiologically different. I mean, this middle of the road, you know, very, you know, average or worse than average swimmer becomes the top swimmer. Once he changed from a, identifying himself from man to woman. And this, you know, all these women, they're doing their best training all their life, and they're losing to this guy. Or even like track and field. And that's what happens when you start letting sin live in your life. Don't think that that's not me. It is you. Yes. I mean... If you lusted after someone, you already committed adultery in your heart. Amen. I mean, how many of you guys have done that? I mean, don't raise your hand, right? I mean, there's things that's going on in your heart right now, in your mind. That's not giving holy to the Lord. You're saving that infant. You're saving that sheep. You're saving that camel. You're saving that ass. You're saving that possession, part of it, for your own self. Kill it. It's like, Lord... I give you my life to church. And I I come to church on Sundays, street preaching, and maybe we have all the activities. I'm not going to miss it. But deep inside, when you're by yourself, all alone, away from your family, you're committing certain sins. That is, you know, so how should I say? I mean, I can't have too many words for it. You know, evil concupiscence, it's like a, very, very another level of lustful sins. But this day and age in this society, that's normal. I mean, the perversion turns into a deviation and it turns into something more wicked and wicked and wicked. So what does happen when you're not obeying completely as the Lord told you to kill all of it? Then you are submitting to the devil yeah. instead of to the Lord. And your heart is submitted, when your heart is submitted to the devil, you know what happens? It starts becoming hard. You know, you heard of the expression, follow ground, right? Break up that follow ground in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 3. Why? When ground is hard and unusable, it is, it's unproductive, it's useless. That's what the devil wants. And for some of you Christians, your heart is very hard, right? When you see a soul, you don't have compassion for lost souls anymore. When, when you see a brother or sister struggling, you don't have compassion for them. When you see your wife and husband struggling in any way, you don't have compassion for them. When you see your children, you don't have compassion. When you see your parents, you don't have any compassion. To me, that's one of the biggest character flaws of Christians, especially Bible-believing Christians. You think that you know the truth. You think you have the King James Bible. You think you have that doctrine. You think you are saved and you're going to heaven. So you forget about compassion. You and I could 100% say that we're not perfect. None of us are perfect. Amen. then you should never, ever look down on people. You should never be cold to anybody, especially brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. But you are. Yes. Why? Because the devil's got your heart. You are. Why? Because your heart has hardened. You are. Why? Because it's full of follow ground. And the only way to get rid of that is why? You have to break up that follow ground. How are you going to break it up? Man, there's going to be pain. 
there's going to be sacrifice. There's going to be a lot of work, a lot of hard work that's going to be involved. You have to make sure that I have to obey rather than sacrifice. You know, when I thought about sacrifice, you could sacrifice without any kind of emotions. You could sacrifice without having even love. Because, for example, I am a head of the family, right? And without me having love for you know, my family, I could still go out to work. I could still you know, make ends meet. I could provide food and whatnot. And some of you are like that to your own family, to the, you know, your loved ones, whoever they are, and to the Lord himself. You have become robotic. That's what I'm trying to say. There's no heart in it. You don't do it because you love the Lord, because you want to obey. You do it because out of, you know, I just have to do it. And then what happens to those people? I found that from, you know, my Christian walk is that when you have that kind of heart, you will compromise. There's no way you're not going to compromise. When things get hard and things get tough, you get to compromise very easily. Yes. And that's where devil wants you to be. Let's turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. So you have to understand that you're being tested. You have to understand that devil wants you to compromise right now. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the devil wants you to be conformed to this world. The devil wants you to compromise. It's funny how people think that, okay, I went to church today. I obey God's commandment, so I'm going to go out to the bar and drink tonight. The Lord shall allow that. You know, they have a weird way of balancing out, things out. You know, I do something for God, and I do something for me. I do something for God, and I do something for my family. I do something for God, and I could sin. I mean, I don't know what people think obedience really is. You know, obedience is just 100%. When you obey, you don't obey 9 out of 10. You obey 10 out of 10. If you obey 9 out of 10, what does that mean? You disobey. Same thing as obeying 1 out of 10, you disobey. Like a sinner, right? There's a great sinner. There's normal sinner. You know, but you're all sinners. And I'm a sinner. Then you have to understand that if I haven't been obeying the Lord, if I haven't been obeying the word of God 100%, then I'm just a disobedient child of God. Amen. Simple as that. Yes. Don't think that you're better than another person because you see someone like, ah, oh, he's terrible. And I saw him smoke, I saw him drink, blah, blah, blah. She's terrible, you know. She's doing all this wicked stuff. And then you're like, you know what? I, don't know, I sometimes fail, right? Just here and there, you know, I give in to my flesh. I mean, that's one of the biggest sins, right? That pride. That you have. Yes. And those people with a bunch of pride issues, you know what they have? They have stubborn issues. They're very stubborn. You know, one thing devil wants you to be also is devil wants you to be stubborn, very stubborn. Right? Who do you think is the hardest people to work with in life? Yes. Stubborn people. When people are stubborn, you can't really do much. Right? You're working with a coworker and you're doing a project together and they're very stubborn. They just have one way, their way, and that's it. And they think whatever it is, their way is the best. You can't work with those people. You have to understand that, hey, when I look at myself, am I being a stubborn Christian today? You know, how do you know you're stubborn? When sin is pointed out in your life, your first reaction is, it wasn't me. As in, I might have done it. It's because of the circumstance. It's because of my wife. It's because of my husband. 
It's because of my loved ones. It's because of somebody, you know. It's because of Joe Biden, right? It's because of politicians. It's because of blah, blah, blah. That's why I've done it. It's because of the system I've done it. Man, you think that excuse will fly at the judgment seat of Christ? No. It's not. It doesn't even fly right now. I mean, can you go to your loved ones, your, even your friends, right? Be like, you know what? You know me. I'm good. I'm naturally a good person. But, you know, situation made me do it. They're thinking, man, this guy is really proud. He thinks that, or she thinks that they're perfect, and they can never fail. So stubbornness is when your sin is pointed out. What do you do with it? Do you truly repent? Or do you just show, like, oh, you know what? You caught me again. I'm sorry, but you do it again in the back. Or you have that vengeful feeling. Don't all of you guys have that? I mean, yeah. As a human being, unless you get rid of it in the, in the wash by the word of God constantly, when you feel like you've been wrong, you definitely want to get back at the person, institution, or anything else. Yes. But you don't look at yourself why that thing happened to you. And of course, the Bible says vengeance is mindset the Lord. You first have to give it to the Lord. You know, the devil uses you know, this vengeful heart very well. Amen. And you can't see straight when you're vengeful. When, when they say you lose it, that's when you commit most horrible sins. Yes. You know, like crime of passion, as they say. But as Christians, you're doing the same thing, right? You come to the Lord. You come to the altar. You make commitment to the Lord. Like, I don't, I'm not going to give my heart to the devil, Lord. My heart is solely, un, you know, given to you. But however, when someone does anything wrong to you, like, Lord, I don't know. I can't guarantee anything. You know, I, I, I don't know, Lord. You know, I want you to forgive me because I'm going to ask for forgiveness. You know, I'm, I'm, giving, I'm asking for forgiveness in advance, right? You know how people say, thanks in advance. They expect them to do something. And you're like, forgive me in advance, Lord. You know, because I'm going to do this because I just can't stop it. You know, those are the people who become very bitter. Those are the people who become very, very hard. And they don't want to listen to anything. With that kind of heart, a lot of times when you read the Word of God, it's not going to really help you. Because your heart is already wrong. It's at the wrong place. So if any of you have like a vengeful heart right now, you have to go to the Lord. Like, Lord, I have this vengeful heart. And I don't know about women. Maybe, yeah, women too. You know, sisters, you could tell me. But men have that macho mentality like, you know, if they hurt me, my family, I'm going to go back at them. You know, they have to pay, right? You know, but those are the exact mentality the devil wants you to have. Imagine... Without God's grace and mercy, you get into that situation, and then you do horrible things, right? You punch the person, but they fall the wrong way. They hit their head on a rock or a, you know, something, and then they get killed. And then you get prosecuted for murder or whatnot. You have to stay behind the bars for like 20 plus years. I mean, is that really glorifying God? What about your family? What about your testimony? What about being able to witness freely outside in the world? And people say, you know what? Inside the prison, I could witness to people. Yeah? I mean, is that what your goal is in life? Commit crime, go to prison, and try to witness to those people. I mean, that shouldn't be your goal in life. You have other opportunities to go. Jail ministries are out there. As a free person, go and you could witness to those folks. You don't have to be there. But that one moment when your heart is given to the devil, when he's compromising, when he's stubborn, what's going to happen? When those tests come, there's a good chance, or better than good chance, that you will do something that you will regret for the rest of your life. Saul. So, did something that he regretted 
not only for the rest of his life, but for all eternity. Then as Christians, are you doing something today that you regret for the rest of your life? Even for eternity, what do you mean? Like your rewards, right? Yes. Your inheritance. What you do after you got saved will determine everything in afterlife. Of course, you won't burn in hell. But God is fair, God. There's going to be different type of rewards. Then it's up to you. When Samuel was telling Saul, you know, you did not obey. You're just all about sacrifice. He makes you think. I mean, if I were in Saul's shoes, what would I have done? What would you have done if you're in Saul's shoes? As a king of Israel, the Lord said, go to Amalekites and destroy everything. Everything. At this point in your Christian walk, would you have obeyed that command? So before you start criticizing Saul, you have to critique yourself. If the Lord told me to get rid of all the sins in my life, will I do it today? Will I do it right now? And before you answer that question, let's look at this verse. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And we're going to look at verse 10. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. And this should be a familiar verse to many. Before you go ahead and say, I'm going to obey, I'm going to give all my heart to the Lord, let's look at this verse, if you're ready. The Bible says, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. More likely than not, the greatest test that's going to come in your life is going to be money. Because in this day and age, it's tough. Tough to be an exemplary Christian to have a you know, job that pays well, you know, do all that stuff. But the Lord said he'll provide all your need according to his riches in Jesus Christ. Philippians 4.19, which means then you're going to get a test right now or sooner or later in your life where you have to choose between God and your wallet. You have to choose between the word of God and your pocket. You have to choose between the ministry and your bank account. That's going to be the greatest test. Because so many Christians fail at that moment. They actually sacrifice a lot, I'm telling you. You know, you kill like almost everything. But there's camel, there's sheep, yes. and there's ass. Like, Lord, I kill like all the sins. But I do still need to feed my family. You know, I do want to give, you know, more tithe to you. You know, I want to support the church more. And that money comes in your life. And that love of money comes in your life. And a lot of times what's related to love of money is compromise, is rejecting and not participating in church ministry, not going to church. And you're going to choose money with power and lust, everything together. They always go hand in hand, right? I mean, look at it. Look at politicians. A lot of times behind them is money, lobbyists, you know, everything. Not only that, there's dirty stuff always involved. And that's what's going to happen to you. As you're tested, and if you have, you know, succeeded in defeating all those tests, you know, by grace of God, then there's going to be a bigger test that's going to come. And when that money comes in your life, it's time to choose money 
what will you do? Is it time to choose the word of God or the money? I mean, if someone gives you, all right, Sunday, you work 40 hours a week, but you know what? If you work Sunday, I'm going to give you triple the salary. You're like, whoa, you know, if I change my schedule from Monday to Friday to, say, you know, Tuesday to Friday plus uh, Sunday, I'm going to get triple the money? Oh, man. Lord will understand. My tie will go higher, right? But you're missing everything else. It's like Lord telling Saul, destroy all the Amalek guys. I'm still going to bless you. Don't you think I'm going to bless you more if you obey me? But you're like, Lord, no, I'll, I'll give you, I'll add to you. You and I sometimes have this misconception that Lord needs something from me. I could add to what Lord has. Lord already has everything. I mean, Lord, Lord doesn't need you. Lord doesn't need your possessions or anything. Right. Lord doesn't need your obedience. He just wants your heart. Yes. Then, for some of you right now, that is the greatest test that's going on. If you're stubborn, you're going to be like, you know what, Lord? <sighs> I'm in a situation where I have to feed my family. Forget about Sundays. Wow, forget about Wednesdays, you know. I'll listen to online message. I'll forget about obeying, you know, Hebrews, you know. Assembling together. Lord, and I can't. You know, money is needed. But when you look at people like George Mueller, they didn't have anything, but they just relied on the Lord with faith, right? But you're like, no, Lord. I don't think you could feed me unless I work that extra hour. What does that show? You know what's the worst thing a parent could feel? When a child doesn't trust them. When child have doubts. I mean, parents here, when you tell your kid, you know what? I'm going to provide for you. And the child goes, no, you're not. <laughs> you're not. So I'm going to go out there and get a job. I'm a six-year-old kid, but, you know, I'm going to go work at a, you know, uh, uh, one of this, you know, retail store. I'm going to sell stuff because I know you cannot feed me. I know you cannot provide my need. And as a parent, how would you feel? You are angry, right? Yes. Disappointed. You're sad. You're like, what happened to my kid to come to that kind of mindset? What happened to you to come to that kind of mindset towards God? I mean, have you gone... I mean, to a great length of apostasy where you backslid in so much that you don't even trust Almighty God who saved you from hell to provide all your need unless you compromise with the world, unless you compromise with the system, unless you compromise with the devil so that you have to do something extra. What was wrong with all these religious people? They had to do something extra than God told them to do. Preach. What was wrong with Cain, right? He tried to give what he did instead of accepting what God told him to do. Right. Anybody else? What's wrong with all these religions out there? Just trust Jesus Christ? No. I have to get baptized. I have to do good works. I have to give money. I have to speak in tongues. I have to see Jesus in dreams. I have to do all this extra. I have to, you know, destroy some other people. You start adding things. Then spiritually speaking, you're no better than Saul. Amen. I'm no better than Saul. Instead of always criticizing and always think that you're better than them, you and I need to get to a point and get on our knees and say, you know what? I'm, I'm just uh, I'm, I'm less than nothing. Yes. Like what Isaiah said. Lord, you know, if any pride, stubbornness, and rebellion comes in my heart, Lord, please, you know, convict me. Yes. Please let me get right. Please let me, like, repent right away. If you have that kind of mindset, just like what the Bible says, you know, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. There's always condition. Through Christ, Amen. you can't do it. Through Christ, you don't have to give what the devil wants. 
Through Christ, you don't have to give your heart. Through Christ, you don't have to compromise. Through Christ, you don't have to choose money over anything else. The Word of God, the, I mean, God Himself. And through Christ, you don't have to be practicing witchcraft. Through Christ, you don't have to be practicing idolatry. Amen. How many of you guys are doing idolatry right now because of your covetousness? Mm. If you love more, you, if you have love of money, I mean, you're practicing idolatry. That is true. Again, you have to work hard. God wants you to do your best. And I, there's no ground for you to be a lazy bum Christian right. and expecting God to provide all your needs. You have to do your best. Amen. And as a high, head of household, as a man, you have to work like the Bible says. Yes. You have to labor. But there's always a balance. Am I laboring to obey the Lord? Or am I laboring to fulfill my desires? Am I laboring to show off to people? You know, a lot of people try to think that, in, especially in Asian culture, you know, having a degree, good degree, is good. For what reason? Number one, is it to get a job to support your family? No to show off to other families. That's it. Not that I want you to have a lower expectation, but do your best and whatever school that you get into, that's it. But just because you don't have an Ivy League degree, you know, or, or this, doesn't mean that you're less of a human being like your parents makes you think. You're not. If you do your best, you're fine. Yes. Then who are you going to obey? He goes, ah, kid, you did your best, but you only got B plus. So no church for you. You're an adult already, okay? You're, you're in college now. I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, I'd rather serve God than you. I mean, do you even have that kind of mindset? You're going to be tested. Devil goes, okay. You know, your child is obeying. Not stubborn, compassionate not rebellious, not compromising. You know what, let's give him a test. You know? And he gets permission. Let's see if your child loves you more than anything else. And he will test you with your most precious thing. Whether it's your wife, husband, family, your possession, something. Every one of you have something that you love the most in your life. And the Lord's going to be like, oh, yeah, okay. I'll give you permission, devil. You do it. And then as you get tested, if you obey, then you're going to give that thing up, whatever it is. But if you don't obey, you're going to try to keep it, whatever it is. And for some of you, that's going on right now. That's your struggle. Lord wants you to give that up. Lord wants you to get rid of it once and for all. You've been struggling. And the word of God says, to obey is better than sacrifice. Now you have clear answer. Amen. Maybe you're asking, Lord, I need some answer, Lord. I've been reading the word of God. You neglect that verse. You know, I've been word of God, you know, love thy neighbor, you know, all that stuff. And Lord, but I've been witnessing outside, you know, proclaiming your gospel. But Lord's like, okay, what about this verse? You know, don't pick and choose word of God. What about this verse? This verse says to obey is better than sacrifice. Okay, now, simple as that. Are you going to obey or are you going to disobey? Are you going to give all your heart to me or just parts of it? Are you going to break up that fallow ground right now? And are you going to start being a productive child of God? Or are you going to be unpro I mean, unproductive rest of your life? So in conclusion... Think about it. The devil wants your heart. If the devil has even part of your heart, he's happy because he could make it enlarge, as in he could take over one of these days. Then you have to make sure that you have mindset of, I will not compromise. I will not give in to the devil by grace of God, by mercies of God, through my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes. And when those tests do come, You'll be able to say yes confidently in the Lord. You could say no confidently in the Lord. You don't have to be in the middle ground.
Because when you're in the middle ground, you're going to submit to it. You're going to yield to it. Man, let's not fool ourselves. We're not that strong. Yes. That's why you have to make sure today, am I giving what the devil wants? Am I making my worst enemy smile on a daily basis? Or am I making sure that I'm going to please my Lord to my best ability with his strengths on a daily basis? Because we'll all find out one day. All of us will find out how we did for the Lord after we got saved at the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. And number one, you do it for him because he first loved you, right? Yes. If that is your motivator, you're going to have no issues. If that's not the motivator, then you're going to have issues. Let's pray. Dear Father, many times we fool ourselves and think that we're not Saul. We're better than those people. But we are same or worse, just having those kind of thoughts. The devil attacked us all the time. He wants to have our heart. Lord God, help us to recognize that if there are any sin in our life where it's been controlling us for not just here and there, but for many, many years, Lord, help us to once and for all kill it. It's going to try to revive itself over and over, but we trust in you. We're so weak, Lord. We want you to answer when the devil knocks. We want you to answer when the flesh, the world, tries to make a sin, Lord. Help us to understand that we have to get rid of our stubborn heart, because which leads to you know, rebellion, I mean, which leads to just pride, which leads to ultimately just disobeying you. Help us to examine our spiritual state on a daily basis and realize that we need spiritual revival on a daily basis as well. I pray that you'll be with everyone here and who's listening, Lord. Whatever the issues of life they're going to the Lord, please solve them according to your will, Lord God. And I pray that you'll come back soon, Lord. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.